So I think if you don't mind, uh, so let me probably do the introductions first. Uh, today's event uh, is a webinar which we planned with our friends from uh, at KPMG uh, and Holman Fenwick Willen, uh, Singapore office. And uh, we'll have two speakers first from uh, Holman Fenwick Willen, Paul Aston and Sammy Biden. Then we'll have uh, Asia Tikeva, who is a tax director from KPMG Kazakhstan. And then uh, myself, Rashid Gaiting, a partner and head of legal practice at KPMG Kazakhstan. I will also speak about legal aspects of mining projects, mining investment in Kazakhstan. So I suggest we start uh, bearing in mind that we have about 60 minutes for, for, the, entire, uh, for the entire webinar. So Sammy, over to you, or Paul, so please. Thank, thank you very much, Rashid, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us today for this webinar. Um, I would like to begin by providing a high level overview to the different stages of a mining project. And then I'll introduce some of the different parties involved in a project. So, a typical mining project can be roughly divided into four different stages. Uh, the first stage is exploration and appraisal, where surveys and mineral samples will be taken, and economic feasibility studies carried out to assess if the project would be commercially viable. If so, then the project would move to the planning and construction of the mine, where environmental and social impact assessments will be carried out, followed by operations and production where the extraction and processing of the mineral take place. Uh, this is the stage where most disputes occur and Paul will talk about some of these in, in detail shortly. Um, finally, when the mine reaches the end of its life after many years, the facilities and equipment will have to be removed and environmental remediation work will play, take place to restore the land. At all of these stages, there is scope for a dispute between a mining company and any number of the following parties here. So just taking the parties in turn, uh, I'll look at them quickly. As with any industrial operation, uh, a mining company may face issues with its employees regarding, for example, remuneration, working conditions, and health and safety matters at the mine site. There may also be issues with local communities located near or affected by the mine development, particularly if there is pollution or forced relocation. Um, disputes with employees and local communities are likely to be local or governed and therefore resolved by domestic courts. I have listed just a small number here of potential suppliers and contractors. These, these companies are obviously essential to the successful operation of the mine. And these contracts are often heavily negotiated. Typically disputes with contractors will involve some breach of contract, uh, for example, breach of quality control requirements. And these contracts often contain an international arbitration dispute resolution clause. Uh, since contractors are often located in third countries and arbitration provides for highly qualified and sector specialists, arbitrators and experts, which is something we'll also discuss a bit later on. Um, now, I note that Asi and Rashid will be talking about company structure in Kazakhstan, so I won't dwell on this. Uh, however, I would like to note from a disputes perspective that uh, relations between an offshore mining company, a local joint venture company, and a host government can sometimes become very fraught. I worked at a law firm in, in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia for two years, and the, the flagship mining project there, Oyu Tolgoi, was blighted for many years by disagreements between the Mongolian government and Rio Tinto regarding the investment agreement. Which, which granted the Mongolian government a 34% share in the local investment vehicle. Um, politicians and the public have consistently argued that the government share has not been high enough, which has caused significant disruption 
and delays to financing and the mine's development. Uh, disputes can also arise in relation to the mining company's exploration and exploitation rights, expropriation, and unforeseen changes to the taxation exemptions. And again, we would, we would expect such disputes to be resolved by international arbitration. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Paul, who will be sharing some of his experience advising on disputes commonly arising from offtake and mining and financing contracts. Okay, Sammy, thank you very much. Um, thank you to our colleagues at KPMG and also to everybody who's kindly attended this seminar, and I hope it's productive. Unfortunately, as in all these one hour seminars, we don't really have the time to dig deep into everything. So I'm going to skate across a number of things. I just wanted to mention at the outset that I do quite a lot of offshore petroleum, oil and gas project work. And there's quite a correlation, there's quite a similarity between the offshore oil and gas development or resource development and mining. And a lot of the same issues arise again and again. And we're seeing in the mining space that uh, pricing disputes in long-term contracts are appearing. Um, these long-term contracts, be they in the offshore or the onshore mining, um, do give rise and have given rise recently to very interesting questions of English law as to whether or not parties should perform their obligations in good faith, hardship and variation clauses. Um, it, it's, a very, it's, a, it's a very evolving area and it's, and it's more so because we've seen significant volatility in commodity prices, both offshore and onshore. And of course, offshore is also mining. Uh, you know, you're mining the seabed. So you have a petroleum mining code, whereas onshore you will have the mining code of, of the relevant government. And there's a lot of similarities. So I hope some of you there are also involved in offshore um, resource development because you will see similarities. I suggest that onshore mining could be slightly, slightly less technical, but I'll leave that for others to, to judge. Now, if you look at this slide, the only takeaway message from this slide is, is to show you really the amazing variety of types of disputes uh, and the areas of disputes. It's not hard to have disputes in this sector. And that's all I'm gonna say about that for the moment. Now, if market prices plunge for any reasons, then buyers may find themselves by, bound by long-term offtake contracts uh, that prices a mineral very substantially above the short-term spot prices. And um, occasionally to the point that a buyer can no longer afford to stay afloat if it continues to pay based on the mining mechanisms. Now I'm talking about long-term contracts and I'm talking about disputes and why they will occur. So the volatility of markets and the fact that however hard people try and negotiate a contract to have an evenly balanced so that Peter's people's expectations will be fulfilled, there are always events that's gonna, that are gonna come along and they're gonna knock those expectations out. And frankly, one party or the other simply cannot afford to continue. And therefore, there has to be negotiation throughout the life of the long-term contracts and there has to be negotiation um, even after sometimes. So people try to develop clauses and, and a lot of disputes arise around the fact that in, in effect, hardship clauses are essentially agreements to agree. But we'll come on to that in a little bit more. The other thing I'm sorry to say is that when prices go up or go down, parties behave in an opportunistic uh, manner and they'll often manipulate disputes or breaches just so that they can get out of being on the wrong side of a market. And that's given rise to, to many disputes. Now we have three types of, um, if I'm talking now about the offtake agreements, the purchase agreements under the mining uh, contracts, long-term, short-term and single spot. And it won't surprise you to know that the major disputes will always concern long-term contracts. Um, I'm so sorry, I was just on that. Ne next slide, please, please Sammy. Yeah, um, there are um, two types of uh, mining finance contract, just by way of background that I'd, I'd like to uh, discuss with you. One is royalty and the other, which is a more recent matter of streaming agreements. Um, 
both royalty and streaming agreements are inherently of a long-term nature and the comments above relate to the, well, the comments in this slide relate to the risks and potential disputes uh, really in relation to the more longer term uh, contracts. The royalty agreements entail, as you probably know, an upfront payment or contribution from the royalty holder um, to a mining company or operator in exchange for a long-term right to receive a fixed percentage of the proceeds from the sale of specific uh, minerals produced from the mining property affected uh, with the royalty. So it's a form of pre-financing really, and obviously the buyer will get a better deal if he's prepared to invest. Streaming agreements are essentially uh, metal purchase and sale agreements in which the streaming company and the buyer, who is the buyer, pays in advance the purchase price to the mining company, uh, the operator, either as an upfront payment or by a series of installments in exchange for the right to acquire a specified amount or percentage of the production of the specified refined metal. And um, in streaming agreements, um, the uh, consideration to be paid or the purchase price for the stream metal is paid in advance by the buyer and in practice treated as a deposit which can be structured as a full upfront payment or a series of installments. So there's flexibility. Interestingly, streaming agreements um, really came into the fore to um, assist on the sale and increase the valuation of byproduct of the main mineral being mined. So for example, if you get silver or metal um, coming out of a copper mine, you can have separate streaming agreements in relation to these byproducts. Um, I will come on to say a little bit more about that later in the context of disputes which can arise. Um, going back to pricing, um, obviously they're based on exchanges which you know and the indexes and these are some of the more familiar. I won't say too much about that. Now pricing arbitrations, pricing disputes are in really complex, require forensic experts can give rise to very expensive and sometimes unnecessary litigation. They have not been so common in the mining space. They've been very common in the long-term natural gas sale agreements and they're well known. Um, they are really triggered. A good pricing clause will normally be restricted to two sort of triggers. One is on a temporal basis, namely, you can have a price review after a set period, five years, two years, whatever you agree, or in exceptional circumstances. And obviously the parties really tend to dispute uh, what is or what is not an exceptional circumstance. There are some civil law jurisdictions, Russia being one, and there certainly are others, where the civil code actually incorporates um, the right of a party to renegotiate with the assistance of the court a long-term contract where there has been a, a surprising or um, extraordinary event. And I have been involved in, in one such case involving a, a coal mine in Russia. So that's something to consider. Um, the main features, next slide please, Sammy. The main features that come up in a pricing dispute will be, was the review process properly triggered and properly invoked? What parts of the pricing terms can be changed? And whether the parties negotiate in good faith to properly adhere to the requirements of the price adjustment process. Now, Normally, these contracts will have a multi-tiered arbitration or dispute resolution clause. And I think that's essential now for the many long-term contracts because for pricing disputes as opposed to other types of disputes, you really need arbitrators and lawyers who understand them. And your experts will be forensic accountants as opposed to engineers. You really need to look, may include engineers, may include all sorts of people. But the problem is that and you sometimes get overzealous arbitration uh, tribunals who effectively try to rewrite the party's bargain, which they're not allowed as a matter of English law to do. A very interesting quotation from an expert in this area called Mark Levy said that, while price review arbitrations share many characteristics of commercial arbitrations, 
they are in many respects quite different. They require the tribunal to invade a space that is normally the preserve of the parties, the negotiated price. This requires a commercial perception that is beyond the experience, if not the reach of many tribunals. And that too has been my experience. Now, can I just say in terms of price reviews, I have been involved in a massive uh, arbitration uh, wh where involving uh, one of the largest open cast coal mine owners in the world uh, who had a number of pits uh, in South Kalimantan. They um, actually operated a number of those pits themselves, but others they contracted to various contractors for the life of the mine. And every five years, those contractors were entitled to apply for a cost review on their plant and equipment. Um, the amount of parameters that went into the cost from, from water treatment, environmental, dynamite, labor, you name it, it was absolutely huge. Uh, and um, it took the parties the best part of four years uh, to uh, four years after the five-year period had expired to finally get an arbitration award on what the new cost increase should be. And they'd been through expert determination and mediation before that. Um, that was okay because at that time, the price of coal was very high, but it's certainly not an exercise to, to embark upon when the price of coal has fallen. Next price, please. Sorry, next slide, please, Sammy. Um, the only, the only, oh, go back, please, one. The only point I wanted to make here is take or pay. And if you could go to the next slide, please. This is a type of offtake agreement. And um, again, it, it gets its um, origins from, uh, from gas sales becoming more popular. Uh, disputes under take or pay or deliver or pay clauses may be less complex than traditional volume disputes uh, where determining the damages due to the seller or the buyer for a failure to respect volume obligations can be complicated process requiring industry as well as valuation experts. Um, next slide, please, Sammy. Um, as I say, disputes which re revolve around profit share also sort of occupy the same area as pricing disputes. They're effectively pricing disputes in, in a different area. Um, determining actual cost as opposed to actual profit, while well, you can readily see that two reasonable experts can probably come up with different, differing views, and they often do. Um, royalty disputes arise where the royalty agreement provides for extensive operating covenants and information rights and such like, and then the actual clauses are, are, are ambiguous. Um, both royalty and streaming agreements do require the parties to calculate profit shares and cost elements. And um, some offtake contracts may also include profit share elements in the pricing. Uh, a common reason, as I've said, for parties launching arbitration, although not always fully spelled out by either party or admitted, is the price determination formula that may result in the contract price being significantly below or above the actual market price of the product at delivery. Other disputes may result from an unfair, well, at least from the point of view of one party or another, allocation of risks associated with a given project including operation, financial, or political risks. Again, that's a scenario which needs to be looked at very carefully. I'm not going to talk about quality disputes, which is the next slide, Sammy. That I, I don't have time for, and, and it's not really that relevant. It does happen in mining, of course. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, force majeure and hardship. I I'm quite cynical about this. I do agree in stabilization and hardship clauses. They can be drafted very well and they can serve very good purpose. In fact, I would say any long-term contract should have a hardship clause, which is a clause that basically allows the parties in the event of some um, unexpected or extraordinary event 
that happens, which makes it completely commercially unviable for one party to continue with the contract, to have a mechanism or at least an agreement in principle that they can sit down and discuss. And even if they can't agree to renegotiate the contract, they can actually agree maybe that the president of X or Y or this um, uh, arbitral body or this firm of quantity surveyors will, will determine the issues that need to be renegotiated. Again, if there's good faith, parties will in fact try and make these hardship disputes work to the extent that the contract is only workable if they both have at least minimum expectations. Force majeure is a meaningless phrase. It means nothing as a matter of English law. What it means essentially is you have an exceptions clause where you have a number of the well-known exceptions and, uh, and that's how it should be treated. And, and does the event, the force majeure event, come within that uh, exceptions clause or not? And like all exceptions clauses, they're very um, uh, limited and restrictively construed. And just to say it again and again, there is no such thing as price majeure. You cannot get out of a contract just because the price has gone against you. So better, I think, to have a proper hardship and uh, 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 hardship dispute uh, clause for, for these types of disputes. Next slide, please, Sammy. Now, this is my final slide, apart from one nice little picture. Um, again, uh, these are all the sort of disputes that I haven't really had time to talk about. Um, I have been involved in two major construction disputes in the uh, open pit casting of a coal mine. Um, they can, of course, uh, uh, require a, a lot of attention. Um, you've also got security documentation under any financing. Um, these, these contracts do give rise to, for example, on um, uh, guarantees, whether they're on demand or whether they're uh, orthodox uh, guarantees as opposed to autonomous, a lot of law on that. In fact, uh, the leading case involves a Mongolian mining company in 2005 uh, and a well-known Japanese oil trading company. And finally, Sammy, if you just go to my photograph so we can show, uh, no, sorry, I was going to go back. You, you've, you've reminded me. I was going to say something about uh, arbitration. You do need lawyers who understand international arbitration. You do need a multi-tiered dispute resolution clause. Some disputes are, are okay for a sole arbitrator. Some you need three. Some are better to mediate. You can often have many disputes. My recommendation is always to have an ARB med ARB clause. Uh, I could give you a talk just on ARB med ARB, but it's a win-win. Um, you start arbitration, all you have to do is appoint the arbitrators, and then the other side is forced to mediate. mediate. And if they don't, there'll be cost provisions. You may have 10 different issues between you, maybe four or five of them are suitable for mediation. If you can crack those early on with limited costs, it provides goodwill to settle the others and continue the relationship. Um, that's really all I, you, also I said, good lawyers will scope out preliminary issues. Uh, and they, they, again, um, if you've got five or six issues, but if you're successful on one, it will be dispositive of the whole case, repudiation and such like frustration um, then you should take that first and, and, and that will help to make sure the arbitration is quick and less expensive. Finally, Sammy, my two pictures. That's uh, actually a dump pit of, of an open cast coal mine. You can see the battens uh, 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 and, uh, and the, um, the tracks there. Uh, you can see the ponding of water at the bottom, which is always a problem. Next slide. And then this happened. You can see it all, it all fell apart because of liquefaction. And um, even the day before this happened, you could see a crack in the, in the floor of the pit, which shows that there was obviously water activity underneath. And of course, the water provided a massive slide and the carefully and expensively arranged massive pit just came trum uh, tumbling down. So that's, again, just a few photographs I have from a a construction dispute in a mine that I was involved with. I appreciate that that has been, ladies and gentlemen, a very varied and wide trip around potential disputes in this area. Uh, I apologize for that, um, but uh, it will at least give you a view of all the exciting disputes that may or may not arise. Thank you. 
Uh, Paul, Sammy, thank you very much. I think that was a very, very good overview of English law, uh, use of English law and uh, dispute resolution mechanisms for mining projects. So I think now we move closer to Kazakhstan, closer to the region. And our next speaker is Asiya Tikeva, who is a tax director at KPMG Kazakhstan. And Asiya, yeah, Asiya's presentation, I think is coming up now. And it's about tax benefits in AIFC and IX. Uh, so uh, Asiya, over to you, please. Thank you, Rashid. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Asiya. I'm a director in International Tax Group uh, at KPMG Kazakhstan, as Rashid uh, told you just right now. So I'm glad uh, to be here with you today, and uh, I'll talk about the tax opportunities that uh, Astana International Financial Center and the Astana International Exchange provide to investors in mining sector. I hope that today's presentation will be useful and helpful to you uh, when contemplating investments in the mining sector of Kazakhstan. Uh, so uh, to get started, let me provide you with a brief overview of AIFC and uh, AIX. The Astana International uh, Financial Center is a um, financial hub in Nur Sultan, capital of Kazakhstan, that provides solutions and technologies in the financial sphere with additional benefits. Uh, so AIFC offers businesses a legal platform which is based on the English law. Uh, and within AIFC, there is a new Astana International Exchange, AIX. Uh, its main uh, strategic partners are the Shanghai Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. So on the right slide, uh, on the right side of the slide, uh, you can see uh, the structure of AIFC. There are um, Astana Financial Services Authorities, uh, International Arbitration Center, AIFC Court, and others. And later, Rashid will talk about AIFC and AIX benefits. And I will focus on the tax benefits provided by AIFC and AIX. So let's have a look at that. Uh, in general, AIFC tax system follows the same principles that are applicable um, uh, for, for the overall tax system in Kazakhstan. So AFC tax regime is mainly regulated by Kazakhstan's tax code, but with a few exceptions related to AFC tax preferences that are governed by the constitutional statute of the AFC and uh, or as we called it, uh, AFC law. AFC law prevails over the, the tax code uh, and AFC law stipulates um, a certain um, uh, uh, tax exemptions for so-called qualifying financial services provided by AFC, as well as uh, other, uh, other tax exemptions um, with respect to AFC participants and their employees. Um, uh, so here you can see the overview of tax benefits of AFC and AAX. Uh, AFC participants registered under the AFC law are regarded as Kazakh tax residents, so they are entitled to benefits and exemptions available under 55 tax treaty concluded with uh, Kazakhstan as well. Also, there are minimal substance requirements to qualify as an, uh, as an AIFC participant. Um, there are also certain tax exemptions for qualifying financial services provided by AFC participants. So uh, we have regulated activities, market activities, and ancillary activities. Uh, so they're collectively known as financial services. So they're exempt from corporate income tax, property tax, and land tax. So we will have a look at the financial services a bit later. Uh, besides uh, the tax benefits provided to the AIFC participants. The uh, AFC law provides tax benefit um, benefits related to Kazakh source dividends, uh, interest, and capital gains. Uh, these benefits also apply until uh, the year 2066. Uh, 
In addition, the AFC law also stipulates uh, tax benefits related to dividend interest and capital gains in connection with securities listed on the Astana International Exchange. We will consider them later. Uh, so uh, I would like just to brief you on the financial services uh, that has just talked about uh, and income from which uh, is exempt in the uh, AFC. Although it might not be relevant to mining companies, uh, let me just show you what types of financial services qualify for tax benefits. The so-called regulated activities, market activities and ancillary services. Uh, on these slides, you can see the types of uh, market activities. And uh, on this slide, you can see some of the types of regulated activities. So overall, the AFC financial services include 27 types of uh, them. And now uh, let me talk about the tax benefits provided by AFC and A AIX, which you might consider when structuring investments through these uh, platforms. Let's start with taxation of dividends, in particular the comparison with taxation of dividends under Kazakhstan's tax code and uh, the AFC law. So uh, the Kazakh tax code indicates that if a mining company pays dividend to its foreign parent company, such dividends uh, should be subject to withholding tax at a standard rate of 15%. Um, the tax code provides a domestic exemptions if two conditions are met. The first condition is uh, it should be necessary to have a three years of ownership before the dividends are declared. And the second one, the mining company needs to process, subsequently process, the so-called subsequently processing its uh, extracted minerals in the amount of 50% or more during the 12 months before the dividends are declared. So, um, and also there are some indication on what kind of raw materials should be taken into account. So this is a little bit quite complicated and in practice uh, meeting those conditions related to domestic tax exemptions uh, may be challenging. So it's worth considering uh, the tax exemption applicable to dividends uh, paid by a uh, Kazakh uh, mining company under AFC law instead. So we, according to AFC law, um, individuals or legal entities, um, regardless of their tax residency, uh, are automatically exempt from personal income tax or corporate income tax on dividends uh, from shares or stakes in the capital of AFC participants. Uh, so uh, please note that uh, currently registering a mining company at uh, the AFC oh. should be possible, but for a rare domiciliation of a mining company, existing Kazakh mining company uh, to the AFC is not feasible at the moment. So maybe Rashid uh, will stress on that. So uh, for a foreign investor that would like to acquire an existing mining company, uh, it, it is recommended to register an SPV at the AFC that would in turn hold shares in the Kazakh subsoil user or Kazakh mining company. Uh, so in such case, dividends uh, distributed by the mining company uh, should not be subject to taxation in Kazakhstan. Uh, and we will talk about a bit later on the structure. So now, now I'd like you to look at this slide regarding the taxation of dividends on securities listed uh, on stock exchanges in Kazakhstan or, or on the ter territory of Kazakhstan. So uh, Kazakh tax code uh, indicates that dividends and interest paid to non-residents on shares which are listed on Kazakhstan stock exchange should be exempt from taxation. And uh, according to uh, AIX, um, AFC law, uh, the same exemption applies to shares listed on the AAX, so um, almost the same uh, treatment with respect to that. So this is the illustrated example of distribution of dividends to foreign shareholders. Here you can see a structure where foreign company owes a mining company and uh, it just uh, under the current tax code regime. 
So uh, if the mining company pays dividends, such dividends are subject to tax in Kazakhstan at a standard rate of 15%, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, in case the conditions for domestic exemption are available, so dividend uh, paid by a mining company can be exempt in Kazakhstan, but it's not sometimes, uh, it is not sometimes possible to do so. So um, if there is a tax treaty between Kazakhstan and, and the jurisdiction where the foreign parent company is a tax resident, the standard rate of 15% can be decreased to 5 or 10% uh, depending on the tax treaty itself and uh, its conditions. To claim tax treaty benefits, the foreign company is required to qualify as a, a beneficial owner of dividends and meet the so-called uh, principal purpose test uh, under the multilateral instrument, uh, which uh, in 2021 um, starts to apply to most of Kazakhstan tax treaties. So we see that uh, if uh, none of the conditions uh, is met, uh, so standard rate of 15% uh, would apply to dividends paid by existing uh, mining company to its foreign shareholder. Here you can see uh, a structure where withholding tax on dividends um, should not be applicable. This is uh, this can be done if an SPV at AFC is interposed between the Kazakh mining company and the foreign shareholder. Uh, there should be no dividend withholding tax when the mining company pays dividend um, to the SPV, and uh, the SPV should be able uh, to exclude uh, such dividend from its corporate income tax base, and then there should be no withholding tax upon distribution of dividends to foreign shareholder. Uh, now let's move to the taxation of um, capital gains. Uh, and here you can see uh, the structure. This is, uh, as, as I mentioned before, the existing mining company cannot uh, read domicile to AFC. So here is the structure where uh, an SPV is interposed uh, between the existing mining company and foreign company. And here, uh, this is the structure where the, uh, the a new mining company is established under the laws of AFC, so it should be possible um, to ex uh, to uh, exempt dividends paid by the new mining company to its foreign shareholder. Uh, so now let's let's have a look at the taxation of capital dividends. Uh, Again, uh, Kazakhstan tax codes uh, indicates that capital gains uh, realized by a foreign company from the sale of a Kazakh mining company is uh, subject to 15% tax. Uh, and the tax code provides the same, the same condition um, for the exemption of such capital gains. They are um, the same as for the dividends. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, to qualify for the domestic tax exemption, uh, certain conditions should be met. And uh, in practice, it's not possible to meet them. So, uh, and under the AIFC law, uh, legal entities and individuals, again, regardless of their tax residents, uh, that are not considered uh, as, as AFC participant, they may enjoy a tax holiday until 2066 on capital gains from the sale of shares or stakes in the capital of AFC participants. Again, uh, here is a good tax advantage, advantage for IAFC tax participants. And uh, here, let's have a look on the capital gains realized from the sale of uh, listed securities. Um, again, we compare here Kazakhstan Stock Exchange and AAX. Uh, to qualify for an exemption for shares listed in uh, Kazakhstan Stock Exchange, there should be a condition that the trade should be an open trade. But for the exemption of um, capital gains realized from the sale of stakes, uh, realizing from securities listed on uh, AAX, there is no such um, uh, condition. 
So again, if uh, a company is listed on a, uh, AAX, any capital gains realized from the sale of uh, securities is exempt from taxation in Kazakhstan. Uh, here again, we drafted uh, you an example. Uh, you see a structure where a foreign company owns a Kazakh mining company. So if the foreign company decides to sell the mining company, any gains arising from such sale should be subject to tax in Kazakhstan at a standard rate of 15%. Um, in case uh, the conditions for domestic exemption are available, capital gains can be exempt in Kazakhstan, uh, but it's not uh, easy to do so. If there is a tax treaty between Kazakhstan and jurisdiction where the foreign parent company is a tax resident, so gain should not be subject to Kazakhstan under certain con conditions, um, meaning that uh, most of the assets of the mining uh, company should not be represented by a movable property. Uh, in practice, it's not sometimes possible because mining assets are mostly regarded as immovable property. So, and in most cases, the tax exemption under the tax treaty should not be provided. But uh, in case uh, the shares of the mining company are not represented by immovable property, then the exemption under the tax treaty should be available. But this exemption is not automatic, uh, meaning that the tax should be remitted to the state and then claimed uh, for, as a refund. And here you can see uh, the structure where this withholding tax should be eliminated. So in case there is an existing mining company, as I said, it should be um, advisable to interpose an SPV. So in case this SPV, which is registered as an AAFC participant or is listed on uh, AAX, it should be possible uh, to get an exemption from withholding tax on any capital gains arising from the sale of uh, this SPV, uh, which is an AFC participant. In case there is a direct ownership of a mining company, uh, which is uh, registered as an AFC participant or listed um, on the Astana uh, International Exchange, again, they should be possible to get uh, an exemption from uh, withholding tax on capital gains in this case. So uh, in conclusion, uh, I'd like to point out that uh, these tax benefits uh, that we've briefly discussed uh, today are advantages and uh, should be further explored and uh, used to benefit any investment in the Kazakhstan's mining sector. Thank you very much, Rashid. Thank you. Thank you, Asia. I think that was very, very good and comprehensive overview. And hopefully some of our participants are either already using this or at least will be looking into possibility to use it in their future investment. So if you don't mind, I will uh, share my, uh, my screen now. Uh, so, yes, sorry. Uh, No, I can't. I can't see it. Uh, Charmaine, can you can you probably help me? Uh, I think I can't move to sharing the screen. Oh yeah, now I see. I can. Well, I hope you can see my screen. I know some of the colleagues didn't have a. Uh, chance to look at it uh, at previous presentation, so I hope you can see it now. Uh, probably, Sammy, if you cannot, I would just assume it's okay. Yeah, good. Thank you, Paul. Uh, so, uh, my favorite line or joke, if you like, about the AFC is that if it didn't exist uh, for for Kazakh sort of and foreign investors, I think we should create it. We should. Uh, uh, do it anyway, simply because I think AIFC, uh, its role, I think it's still underestimated by business people in Kazakhstan, lawyers, accountants, tax advisors, etc. I think there are a lot of opportunities which are brought by AIFC 
And one of them is obviously use of uh, AIFC laws based on the English law, principles of English law. So uh, AIFC benefits, I'm not going to go into too much details, but uh, just briefly access to investors and projects, international practices, English language, of course, access to financing, and it could be different options, including stock exchange, IEX, private equity funds, junior mining, et cetera, et cetera. Simplified currency regime, preferential tax regime, visa support. And one more thing, which I haven't even mentioned here because it's still in progress, but there is a program uh, which is now with the government and probably will be uh, adopted uh, by the par parliament. It's a so-called uh, investment uh, residence regime where investors into uh, AIFC and Kazakh project via AIFC will have certain uh, residency rights, similar to uh, Dubai or UK, et cetera. Uh, use of AFC laws for MA transactions and why uh, MA transactions under AFC laws are far more flexible. So, one is obviously, as I said, AFC laws are based on English law principles. It's not English law directly applicable, as some of my uh, contacts or colleagues think. It's, um, it's a separate body of law. And uh, in fact, Kazakhstan, again, not many even lawyers realize that, Kazakhstan have at the moment two jurisdictions. One is a uh, mainland Kazakh laws, and second would be AIFC laws, which are obviously based on uh, common law principles. Uh, another thing why m and transactions can be uh, interesting for, uh, and you, you interested in using AIFC laws would be obligations between AFC participants can be expressed in any currency. And as you, as most of you know, if we talk about two Kazakh, Kazakh to Kazakh sort of parties, it must be in local currency, Tenge. Then uh, instruments such as representations, warranties, and indemnities, as well as put option and call options can be used uh, in uh, share purchase agreement under uh, AIFC laws, or it could be actually English laws used for SPA share purchase agreement, which is not possible obviously for uh, most uh, Kazakh sort of mainland m and transactions. Uh, Shareholders agreement, another thing which is interesting because Kazakh law does not recognize shareholders agreements. And uh, I think the general view is that it's possible to sign one between shareholders in Kazakh company, but the courts are not going to enforce them. And obviously if they are not going to enforce them, what is the point to try to sign the document which is supposed to settle any uh, type of relationship between shareholders. If, if, if it's not enforceable then by Kazakh courts, why would you want to do it? So uh, in AIFC is obviously co uh, contrary where uh, AIFC registered company can have a shareholders agreement governed by AFC laws or could be governed by English laws. So which is obviously very, uh, very different and preferential. Uh, we've done a deal uh, for, unfortunately didn't go ahead after due diligence uh, I think it was mainly on kind of geological sort of study, et cetera. But uh, doing this due diligence for a mining company, foreign mining company, trying to acquire a uh, Kazakh mining company through AIFC registered SPV, uh, we, we came up with a list of different issues to watch out. And I listed them here. So what, some of them are general, some of them are com company specific or maybe AIFC specific. And obviously for mining companies, something like number four, provision of contracts, change of control, consents, notices. It's not just about commercial con contracts, but also so-called so subsoil use contracts, which are obviously the, uh, the basis for operating a mining company. So I listed here uh, the issues to watch out and uh, I'm sure we can uh, uh, read it at your own time. Uh, one, one of the things which uh, we found uh, difficult in that particular uh, uh, transaction during the, our due diligence was ownership of title for different, uh, for different uh, types of assets, plant, machinery, real estate, inventory, intellectual property, et cetera, because they're all in different registries and some of them, they are, they are obviously not registered at all. So uh, it was something to watch out. Uh, 
so that's about the uh, and a and uh, in, in and use of AIC laws for m a transactions another thing which i wanted to cover today is the new listing rules for junior mining companies and that's something very interested and i'm sure ix was uh, looking at international experience and myself and my my colleagues we were working with a legal team at in-house legal team at ix uh, helping to review and uh, uh, comment on the draft uh, mining company uh, mining company rules and the idea is that uh, junior mining companies should have a sort of fast track and certain uh, exemptions uh, which are not available for any other companies and they are obviously project specific and uh, particular managerial team specific if you like So main requirements uh, for admission to training of mining companies would be that mining companies should obtain relevant permits from regulatory bodies. So that's kind of obvious. Uh, and then obviously uh, there the should be a consent of a competent authority of Kazakhstan uh, if uh, we talk about mining company with a mineral project in Kazakhstan. And it's not just about Kazakh sort of registered company or AFC registered company, it could be foreign company coming to, to list on IX. Uh, for uranium, which is obviously very, very different from uh, main kind of other types of mining companies, there is, there is a need for wave of priority, right? But that's, uh, that's obviously been around for many years and still the case for uranium companies. Uh, and uh, something which is kind of, a, uh, again, obvious and uh, common for public companies, public listed companies, but unusual for private companies in Kazakhstan, etc., that all public disclosures and announcements should be made in compliance with qualifying reporting standard. So basically trying to eliminate the uh, illegal opportunities for, uh, for people connected to management, to shareholders, etc., uh, on fluctuation of price, etc., having access to sensitive uh, information. Uh, so that's that's basically in terms of uh, consents and waivers. Uh, I think we we just have a summary here uh, uh, of what needs to be done and uh, certain consents and waivers. Uh, why uh, why? Uh, mining company would be interested in IX for, for, for listing. So the, pro the client we had was actually a listed company from one of the large mining jurisdictions. And they thought that if, uh, if they go and acquire a Kazakh mining company uh, through SPV, uh, uh, registered on uh, AIFC, at some point they will want to consider uh, listing of this uh, business uh, simply because they felt that uh, investors closer to the region, they better understand uh, mining projects here in Kazakhstan. Uh, maybe you, you talk not just about Kazakh investors, but Russian investors, Uzbek investors, Chinese investors, etc. And uh, there are obviously some other uh, advantages, uh, like uh, cooperation of IX with Shanghai Stock Exchange and a number of other stock exchanges around the world. Uh, and then obviously for uh, foreign investors, especially Western investors, IX rules and its enforcement ensures high level of transparency, which is obviously something what uh, foreign, especially Western investors would expect. Uh, again, IX rules based on principles of English law, uh, tax incentives, I think we've already covered them uh, during ICR's presentation. And uh, different asset classes, including equity, debt, derivative instruments, et cetera, and something which is unusual for Kazakhstan and uh, continental uh, legal system, but quite common for uh, English and other sort of common law jurisdictions, uh, situation where you could have different classes of shares given certain rights, including control of the company. As you know, some of the largest uh, listed companies like Facebook, et cetera, they all have different classes of shares where uh, original shareholders, uh, founding, part, founding shareholders, have priority rights and have uh, almost full control of the company when it comes to uh, management decisions. Uh, overview of Kazakh mining projects. So I'll just leave them here. Uh, there are a number of them. Uh, as you know, uh, there are different uh, large mining companies, foreign large companies operating in Kazakhstan. Some, uh, some of the sort of largest local privatized companies operate in, uh, in Kazakhstan and the region. Uh, there is a privatization, uh, as we all know, uh, through public announcements 
of the uh, state uh, so-called national mining company, Tolkien Samruk. So I'm sure it will be happening next uh, one or two years. And I hope uh, AIFC, uh, New Mining Code, IX, and other sort of institutions of AIFC will be of help for further investments in Kazakh mining projects. So I think that's, that's it from me. Uh, and uh, I think we, we, we now happy to take any questions and I think we have probably five, max 10 minutes for that. Thank you, everyone. Uh, do we have any questions? I think they can be typed in Q&A Q &A section at the bottom of the screen. Rashid, I have uh, one small observation I'd like to make, which I meant to make in my talk, but didn't. Might help people start the chat. Um, I have, for many years, being visited uh, the AIFC. I have um, given seminars and, and been present at the opening of the AIFC court. Uh, I've looked at the arbitration rules and the mediation rules. Um, it's a first class arbitration centre. Uh, there was absolutely no reason why people who are involved in business in Kazakhstan or indeed in the region uh, should, should not consider the AFC court and arbitral system as being perfectly adequate to their needs. As you quite rightly pointed out, the AIFC law is separate and distinct from Kazakhstan law. It is recognized by the domestic legal system, the AIFC uh, uh, court or arbitral uh, judgments and awards will be honored within Kazakhstan as though there were uh, judgments and, and or awards of institutions in Kazakhstan. And they are based on English common law principles. Uh, the panel of international arbitrators uh, is um, as good as you'll find anywhere else. And of course, you can appoint your own arbitrators. Uh, the proceedings are in English. Um, it's very flexible. Um, it's, it's, it's a wonderful example of the rise of the new international commercial court, uh, of which there are a number around the world. There are two or three in China, there's an excellent one in Singapore. Of course, you have the DIFC and others, but I think in that region, by which I mean the whole of uh, the Middle East and uh, CIS region, I think the AFC is, is going to be a wonderful example of a vibrant international court and, and arbitral system. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Paul. Uh, I think that's, that's very, very uh, good observation and I think uh, critics of AIFC point out, obviously, to the cost and uh, some other issues. But I think the history of these uh, financial centers around the world uh, shows that you have to have political will to do it long term. You have to have budget available for next 10, 15, whatever number of years, long term again. And then obviously promoting, promoting and promoting this center for endlessly, basically, and uh, I do appreciate now it's far more difficult without physical traveling and face to face. But I think that's that's a long term game and people should recognize that and understand it. So I think we have a number of questions uh, to to different uh, to different speakers. So if you don't mind, as a, as a moderator, I will uh, probably allocate them. So the first one was from Lee Slom, uh, a question for Asia. The 50% local use secondary processing requirement, for example, from uh, withholding tax, how is primary against secondary processing defined? So, uh, uh, so yeah, maybe you can, you can. Yeah, uh, actually okay. here, um, I look at the Kazakhstan uh, subsoil use code, code on subsoil use uh, should be referred to. So uh, um, normally uh, this code indicates what is regarded as primary processing and what is regarded as secondary processing. So, but in practice, primary processing is just the extraction of uh, raw materials uh, on uh, extract from the subsurface. So, and minimal uh, first uh, processing. This uh, normally is regarded as uh, primary processing. The second processing of raw materials into something like um, 
uh, for um, meat product, it, it should be regarded as secondary processing, but uh, the consultation with uh, uh, advisors who, who advise on code on subsoil use uh, is necessary here. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Asia. Uh, we have uh, a number of other questions. So uh, a question which I think is very interesting from Mike Bear, is it possible to lease on IX as a junior mining company without a specific project, but with a business model that wishes to attract capital to acquire licenses? So uh, my, my, my short answer, I don't really know. I, I'm sure it hasn't been envisaged. Although myself as a lawyer, uh, I started working on a number of mining projects globally and in Kazakhstan back to uh, work at Norton Rose in London. And I do recall uh, my supervisor, my boss was listing mining companies without mining licenses on I AIM, alternative investment market, uh, junior market of London Stock Exchange like weekly and that was 2005 2006 2007 so i i i'm, I'm not sure that that uh, that ix uh intended to work particularly for with these kind of companies who would like to have a business model who have a management team ready and they just need money to acquire the licenses so but i think that's something mike to to bear in mind and i'm more than happy to get to get into a separate discussion on that and happy to involve uh, uh, IX as a stock exchange and AIFC, relevant AIFC institutions as well, because I personally see a lot of interest and benefit in trying to do that. Uh, we have uh, another another question uh, from Janibek Amankulov. Uh, how many legal cases have been settled to date through the AIFC platform, court and arbitration center? I think I've heard of just one minor case how wide it is it's used for dispute resolution by Kazakh or foreign companies. So Paul, I guess that's a question for you. And uh, if you don't mind to start and then probably I will be, I will be joining as well, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think the, 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 the um, simple answer is very few, but I sat on the board of the SCMA, which is the Singapore Chamber of maritime arbitration. It does a lot more than maritime, it does shipbuilding, construction, trading. Um, and that, um, that commenced uh, whoa, maybe 20 years ago and it took a long time to get any take up. Um, it's, it's the trajectory is that of a plane, very, very flat and then exponentially high. The SIC, which is now regarded as um, certainly on terms of the LCIA, the ICC, uh, and I would say in many respects better uh, or more appropriate for certain arbitrations, um, is, is a, a, an internationally recognized uh, administered arbitration body. Um, and that takes taken 20 years with the marvelous government support that it's had, actually a little bit more than that, more like 30. Um, so I expect in the same way that the AIFC will take some time to really get traction. What I would, however, add is that unlike um, a number of arbitral institutions and like, for example, the DIFC, it is able to offer both high court, international commercial court on English law principles with judges. Um, it is able to offer that and with very flexible rules of procedure where the court will take control and, and run the case properly, as well as an international administrative uh, procedure, as well as mediation and other forms of dispute resolution. So I think there's a lack of knowledge out there. People need to be educated. Pe and there's so many people don't understand the difference, for example, between mediation and arbitration. People that should, people don't understand the difference between ad hoc arbitration arbitration uh, and administrative arbitration. Um, people don't understand the difference between choice of law and jurisdiction, i.e. where the dispute will be, will be handled. Um, I don't expect them to. I'm not an engineer. I don't understand uh, all of that. But uh, if you're going to be involved in these international contracts, you, you need to be talking with someone who does. Uh, I certainly am a fan of the um, 
the foundations and the base of uh, the AI court. And yeah, to me, it, it, it will be successful, but it will take time. These things do. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, I quite agree with you. And I think there are about four or five cases now in the AFC court. One of them is actually relevant to our today's discussion. It's a mining company called Aurora, had, yeah. which had a dispute with its uh, subcontractor, I think. And it's been for about half a million US dollars. So it went through fast track, as far as I understand. And the uh, last time I talked to the CEO of, uh, of the company, he said, uh, they basically managed to enforce it, and they basically the counterparty agreed to, to 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 basically uh, recognize the judgment, etc. So, so it's been it's been enforced already. So they got money. So I think that's 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 a good, that's that that's what we want to hear, I guess. But I agree with you, Paul. It will take some time before uh, before there will be a serious number of uh, cases, both in arbitration at and at the court. And remember. Um, Thank you. And remember, these international judges, these international arbitrators, like international lawyers and people like yourselves, are used to dealing with things by remote and Zoom. Actually, we've got much better of it because of COVID. I was involved in a case where we're putting a company into liquidation in the Cayman Islands. Um, we, we were successful in, in, in defending the um, companies injunction to restrain us from doing so. They appeal to the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal of the Cayman Islands consists of uh, QCs and silks who are actually in the main based in London. And they were all trapped in London and couldn't go to the Cayman Islands because of COVID. And they ended up hearing it remotely in London, even though it was a Court of Appeal decision of the Cayman Islands. So that shows you the flexibility that, that international law providers are able to offer and judges and good arbitral systems as well. I mean, that, that as I say, was the Court of Appeal of the Cayman Islands. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you very much. I think we have a couple of more questions left, but I suggest we probably wrap up now, uh, but uh, deal with these questions separately if, uh, if these, uh, those who are asked don't mind. And, uh, Thank you very much to, to everyone, uh, to our speakers, first of all, and co-organizers of this event, TPMG and Holm and Fenwick Willen. And uh, at the same time, uh, I would like to thank all who joined us today uh, during their busy, busy working days, etc. And uh, I hope it was useful. And uh, I'm sure we'll come back to this uh, topic of AIC mining, uh, natural resources kind of sector generally. Uh, and use of AIFC uh, institutions and AIFC laws for that. So thank you very much, everyone, and hope to see you again soon. Take care. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.